Uh, hello everyone, I'm Eiichiro Kokubo. I'm from National Astronomical Observatory of Japan and also uh, University of Tokyo. Today I talk about the formation of terrestrial planets. So we have already learned from Nadal's talk the basic physics behind the planet formation. So then I like to focus on the dynamical uh, models, so which is more relevant to the terrestrial planet formation in the solar system. And before starting the, to my talk, I'd like to introduce some recent review papers. So if you are interested in some specific topics uh, in my talk, please refer to these uh, papers. So these are about the formation of terrestrial planets, not only in the solar system, but in exoplanetary systems too. So uh, you can find maybe this uh, view graph on the net, right? Later, this conference. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. So let me start my talk with introducing some uh, into important uh, probabilities of terrestrial planets in the solar system. So then i like to uh, explain the basics of standard formation scenario or maybe conventional uh, formation scenario. We have already uh, heard a lot about this uh, from Nadal's uh, talk. And then we move on to each important process. Uh, first one is planetesimal formation, and then planetesimal accretion, so coagulation. And then the last stage of the terrestrial planet formation, at least in the solar system, is considered as a giant impact stage. So where uh, relatively big bodies collide with one another to complete the terrestrial planets. So which is very important because this stage all the orbital you know, the properties or, and spin parameters are determined. So which is very uh, related to the habitability, right? And then after uh, introducing the standard scenario, I'd like to show some examples of the extension of the standard scenario. So including, we have already seen this Grand Tuck uh, model. And then we summarize uh, my talk. And then at last, I'd like to show you some animations, uh, photographic animations rendered from our uh, group's uh, N-body simulations. Okay. So terrestrial planets, we already know that. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are terrestrial planets, right? And they are also called uh, as uh, rocky planets. So they reside in the inner part of the planetary systems uh, in the solar system. So uh, ranging from 0.4 to 1.4 AU. And the mass uh, ranges about 0.1 to uh, 1 Asmus. And this uh, on the right, so this is the, the cross section of the typical uh, terrestrial planet. So very roughly speaking, it consists of two layers. So uh, in the center, we have the core consisting of mainly of iron and maybe some uh, nickel and some light elements. And surrounding it is this mantle. So mainly there are, this is silicates. So, and this rock to, oh, sorry, a rock to iron or mantle to core ratio in mass uh, is different from planet to planet. For example, uh, for the Earth, the core mass is about 30% of the total mass. And, but for Mercury, uh, I think the core mass is now estimated to be as maybe about 70, 70 uh, percent. So actually, the Mercury is not a rocky planet, it's an iron uh, planet. And then this figure shows the mass uh, against the semi-major axis. So by looking at this figure, what do you think about the mass distribution of terrestrial planets in the solar system? So we know this, so from this plot, maybe there are two populations, right? So the bigger ones and then smaller ones. So this is Venus and Earth, and this is Mercury and Mars. So it seems there are two populations, so why? So we like to uh, explain this during the course of formation, right? And this uh, figure shows the orbital elements. So semi-major axis, and uh, black points are eccentricities, and white ones are inclinations. So Mercury, Venus are smart. So very roughly speaking, so, oh, sorry, so inclination here, the unit is radian, not degree. So all of them are smaller than, say, 0.1. 
So that means the, the terrestrial planet's orbit are nearly circular, and also the mutual inclination is very small, so core planar. So in this figure, the inclination is measured from the mean uh, orbital plane of the solar system, called the Laplace plane. So they are very, uh, well, the orbits are very neat, well organized. And this figure uh, shows you the spin parameters. So the horizontal axis is the, the period in the unit of days. And the vertical axis is obliquity. Obliquity is the inclination between the spin axis and orbit normal. So as you know, the Earth has 23.4 degree. So from this figure, so this is, uh, I think, uh, Earth and Mars. And this is Mercury, right? So they are prograde. They, they have, they have prograde spin. So prograde here spin means the spin direction is the same as orbit direction. But Venus has retrograde spin. And the period is, is larger than 200 days. So it's almost, you know, not spinning. So from this figure, we, we can say, well, it's a bit difficult to say <laughs> quantitatively the probabilities, but at least we can say it's very diverse, right? So this probably also I like to, well, we like to explain during the course of formation. Let me recap briefly the important probabilities when we consider the, the origin of terrestrial planets. So they have bimodal uh, mass distribution, so large planets and small planets, right? And orbit, the semi-major axis, uh, you know, in the inner part of the solar system. So I call here the localization. So we don't have terrestrial planets inside the 0.4 AU and outside 1.5 AU. So it's very limited. The range is very limited. And Large planets are inside, I mean Venus and Earth are inside this distribution, and Mercury and Mars are outside, right? And small, they, they all planets have small eccentricities, with small eccentricities and inclinations. Especially Venus and Earth, eccentricities and inclinations are small. And spin obliquity is very diverse, right? From zero to 180. And so period uh, ranges from well, about one day and 200 day, the order, I mean, order here. So, but please note, the effective spin period of the Earth moon system, I mean, if the angular momentum of the Earth moon system is just added to one Earth, so this, this, the Earth spin uh, has, may have this uh, period of four hour spin. It's very fast spin. So the Earth's moon system has relatively large angular momentum, corresponding to this four-hour uh, spin period. And compositions, so they're also different. So especially, so Mercury is different from others. So these are important uh, probabilities of terrestrial planets. So we like to explain. And of course, so we all here are interested in the habitability of planets. And so because maybe tomorrow or maybe in this late afternoon, we discuss about the habitability, but so habitability is generally defined as this, right? So habitability is like stable existence of large scale surface liquid water, because we, well, our type of life needs liquid water during at, at least some part of our life cycle. And this habitability, the existence of liquid water, can be translated into some dynamical conditions of planets. So mass, orbit, and also spin parameters. All these, you know, matters when we consider the habitability. But the classical habitability only, you know, considers the semi-major axis. But eccentricity, but already, we, we have already these papers discussing about the effect of eccentricity, obliquity, and spin. So these dynamical properties are very important when we consider the habitability, as we know. 
Okay, so now let me uh, introduce you the standard formation scenario. But actually, we have already heard from Nadal. So let me briefly uh, repeat that. So behind this standard formation scenario, there are two hypotheses. So the first one is this hypothesis. So we consider that a planetary system uh, is formed from a light circumstellar disk. It's called protoplanetary disk. And that is a byproduct of star formation. And this disk has the same composition as the host star. Then second hypothesis is called the planetesimal hypothesis. So from only the, the dust of the disk, the so planetesimals are first formed somehow. And solid planets, like terrestrial planets and ice giants, are formed by accretion of this uh, planetesimals. And to form gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, so first the relatively large uh, solid planets, quartz, are formed by accretion of planetesimals. And then it becomes big enough to capture gas from protoplanetary disk by its self-gravity. So then it, the, the formation of the gas giants are kind of two-step. And by this process, so first we form core, then core accretes gas. So this uh, model is also called a uh, core accretion model or core nucleated accretion model. And these uh, models or scenarios are developed independently by Safronov uh, and Hayashi's group and also some uh, Polak et al. And I bring here this very, very rare important picture showing, this is Hayashi. So astrophysics major students, you, know, may, you may know the Hayashi phase, right? For star formation. And also the, for the planetary people, you, we know Hayashi disk, right? So this is Hayashi, and this is Safronov from the Soviet Union. So, and Hayashi and Safronov, it's, when I was first see this, this picture, I was very, you know, kind of surprised and also moved. So these two giants, <laughs> so, uh, you know, stand to, next to each other. But, well, you don't have to remember, but it's a good, uh, you know, the picture. Okay, so what is this standard formation scenario? So this is a cartoon describing it. So this is the edge on view of the uh, protoplanetary disk. The formation scenario consists of three stages, or three acts. The first one is the formation of planetesimals from dust. And the second one is formation of protoplanets uh, from planetesimals. But this protoplanet is also uh, called uh, embryos. So embryos and protoplanets in my talk is, are the same. And the last stage is formation of terrestrial planets from protoplanets. And this, is, this stage is known as the giant impact stage. So we'll uh, look through all uh, stages. So from Inga's talk, we already uh, learned about the, the latest picture of the protoplanetary disk. But for the standard disk model, we just assume this very simple uh, protoplanetary disk. So the size is about the same size of the planetary uh, region. So in the solar system case, so it's around maybe radius is 30 AU. And mass is about 1% uh, of the sun. And it, you know, the composition is the same as the sun, which, which means uh, the ga dust to gas ratio is, dust to gas ratio is only uh, 1%, right? But also, uh, we have already uh, know from uh, maybe Inga's and also Nadal's talk about this snow line. So snow line is the, the border uh, of the, the composition of dust component. So the definition of snow line is for the H2O snow line, uh, it's the distance from the central star uh, to the, the point where the disk temperature is about 170K, so which is the H2O condensation temperature under very low pressure, like protoplanetary disks. And so if the disk is optically thin, I mean, here the main heat source uh, of the disk is the central star. So in that case, the snow line is around 3 AU. 
And inside 3AU, the dust is almost rocky. And outside the snow line is icy. Of course, this part, we have rocky dust, but assuming the solar abundance. So H2O is about four times more here uh, beyond the snow line. So we just, then we say this main component of dust is icy outside the snow line. And this snow line sets the, the basic boundary between rocky and icy bodies. Well, of course, we know they migrate, but the formation, for the formation, so this snow line is the boundary. Right? So now uh, we come to this planetesimal formation part. So this is, I think, the, now the most difficult uh, stage of planet uh, formation. So let me start with uh, introducing the two classical uh, models. The first one is it's very simple, just pairwise coagulation of dust grains, right? But as we have already uh, learned from Nadal, so these compact dust grains may fall onto the central star before it, can, it grows to the size of planetesimals. So it's called a radial drift barrier. So then to, to solve this problem, the people are working on the standard formation scenario, they they found this uh, mechanism called gravitational instability of a dust layer. So here, so this is a part of the protoplanetary disk, and it consists of, of gas and dust. So dust settles toward the mid-plane. And once the, the density of the uh, dust layer becomes higher than the Roche density or some critical density, then the dust layer becomes gravitationally unstable to fragment, then these fragments can shrink to finally become uh, planetesimals. But also this, the second classical model has uh, now we understand as a difficulty, difficulty. Because to, to this mechanism to operate, the protoplanetary disk, I, I mean gas component, should be very calm. So otherwise, the dust components cannot settle toward the mid-plane. But from the observations, we can estimate the strength of the turbulence of the protoplanetary disk. And now we, I think we agree that so maybe it's very difficult for, for this kind of uh, mechanism because this protoplanetary gas is too, a little bit too, too turbulent. So then how can we form uh, planetesimals? So and then I list up uh, recent models, three recent models. The first one is streaming instability. So I'm sorry, I don't have time to go into details, but this is a kind of two component fluid instability. So it's like a traffic jam uh, effect. So particle, so this streaming instability is a particle form uh, clumps. And where uh, we can expect the gravitational instability from uh, planetesimals. And the second one is the secular gravitational instability, so which I was also uh, I worked on. So this is not the dynamical uh, gravitational instability we talked about uh, here, but the secular gravitational instability, so which occurs on a time scale of energy dissipation. So in this case. Uh, the dust component's uh, kinematic energy is dissipated by gas friction. So on this time scale, just very gradually, the dust can, be, uh, can settle toward the midline, but on a longer time scale. So this is also one possibility. And uh, the third one is pairwise coagulation porous dust aggregates. So here, this porous is different from the classical one. So classical one, I put here compact. So the, what is this uh, porous dust aggregate model? So we also call the fluffy dust uh, model. I'm sorry, it's maybe hard to see. So we have already heard from Nadal that, so these days we think, so what, when dust aggregates grow, so by pairwise coagulations, 
it's very hard to form very compact, high density uh, particles. But like this kind of aggregate with fractal dimension around two are formed by pairwise coagulation. Let me show you this movie. So just pairwise coagulations of equal size, I mean equal number of uh, monomers. And what we have already found is the original compaction or a compression is very, uh, is not effective, effective enough to form very compact grains. So now we think the pairwise coagulation of those grains leads to formation of this kind of fluffy, porous, low density uh, aggregates. Right, and then, okay, so then, so this figure shows the pathway of uh, growth of dust aggregates, fluffy dust aggregates, starting from a monomer, right? So by, by this growth, the density becomes lower and low as they grow. But then this gas compression, I mean, the compression by uh, run pressure, and also self-gravity forms. And so they, they found uh, the path, avoiding the radial drift barrier. So along this line, so the dust aggregates can grow, avoiding the falling down onto the central star. So, and also, we studied this stage in detail, the dynamics of dust aggregates to found, so this is the same, sorry, the density mass uh, plane, and this is the dust uh, growth of dust aggregates. And here, the self-gravity compression is effective. So by this evolution, the dust aggregates the inevitably hit this Q equals rest than two area. So this is here, Q is the two more as Q. Maybe astrophysicist students know that. So this is the indicator of the stability of the disk system. So if Q is smaller than two, the disk is gravitationally unstable against the non-axisymmetric perturbation. So then what we found is, so at this stage, so this kind of thing happens. So this is the simulation of that stage. So we are looking at the, some part of the protoplanetary disk, uh, face on. So there are fluffy dust aggregates. But then this, the layer becomes dense enough. So we be, first there's some inclined dense, uh, denser area uh, uh, are formed, and then it fragments to form planetesimals. But please remember, I'm not saying this is the mode of planetesimal formation. <laughs> so because this animation is very persuasive. It's, uh, uh, but this kind of thing can happen under some disk conditions. So this is a kind of revival of the classical gravitational instability model, but with fluffy dust aggregates. So with compact dust aggregates, we cannot expect that. But with fluffy dust aggregates, we can have this. Okay, but as well, already uh, Nadal talked about, but somehow we, we think that planetesimals are formed. Because, well, from the, the crater records in the RE solar system, we, we, we now know uh, that there are many small bodies in the solar system. And also the comets. So the comet sizes are all very similar, around 10 kilometers, right? So these are maybe uh, residual, residuals of planetesimals. So for the later use, we introduce this kind of planetesimal system now. So if the gravitational instability uh, takes place, then we can estimate the mass of the planetesimals from the, the critical wavelengths of the 
uh, instability, so which is about uh, 10 to the 18 uh, kilogram. So assuming the, the maybe I forgot, two to three uh, gram per cc the density, so the size is about kilometer. And for the later use, we introduce this surface density distribution of planetesimals by this power law formula. So here, sigma one is the surface density of one AU, and alpha is the radial uh, exponent. So this Hayashi's uh, disk uh, is about sigma one is about ten, and alpha is three halves. Okay. So now we have planetesimals, and then next, what happens? So before uh, going into the planetesimal accretion, let me introduce uh, some. Uh, basic concepts uh, important to planetesimal accretion. The first one is random velocity. So this is the deviation uh, velocity from a non-inclined circular orbit given by this uh, equation. So here, E is the eccentricity, I is the inclination in radian, and VK is the Keplerian circular velocity. And this random velocity increases by gravitational scattering among planetesimals on average, right? And so during the, this growth of planetesimals, there's always some equilibrium uh, random velocity where the effect of gravitational scattering, so which increases the random energy, a uh, random velocity, and also the gas drag which dumps the eccentricity and inclination, balance. So under this equilibrium random velocity, uh, planetesimal accretion proceeds. Then the next uh, important thing is Hill uh, or Roche or Tidal or sometimes called Jacobi uh, radius. And so uh, kindly, Nadal already uh, introduced this uh, in his talk. But this is the, the radius of the potential well of an orbiting body, right? So given by this equation. So where here, so M is the mass of this orbiting body, and MC is the mass of the central uh, object, and A is the semi-major axis. So this is the kind of poten gravitational reach uh, of, an inter of an orbiting body. So, and I use these uh, terms uh, later. Okay, so now let me uh, oh, let us uh, consider the growth uh, modes of planetesimals. So, uh, suppose we have now two planetesimals with mass M1 and M2. So maybe initially M1 is larger than M2, let's assume. And this, the time uh, evolution of this ratio is given by this formula, right? Just we, I expanded. And from this uh, equation, we know, so it is this relative growth rate that governs the growth mode. So now we assume this uh, growth, relative growth rate is proportional to some power of mass, P. So if P is negative, so if this is the decrease function of the mass of this growing body, so if initially M1 is larger than M2, then the right-hand side of this equation becomes negative, right? So means, so this, the mass ratio tends to be unity. So in other words, they all grow equally so with this small is called ordinary growth. But if this is the increased function of M, and M1 is initially larger than M2, then this right-hand side is positive. Then mass ratio increases. So this small is called runaway growth. And around the maybe uh, late 80s and 90s, so some, there was some discussion uh, on the growth mode of planetesimals. And we now know from the uh, n-body simulations that the growth mode is at least initially runaway growth. But before showing that, let me introduce the growth rate. 
to understand the physics uh, behind the growth mode. So now, uh, suppose, so this uh, planetesimal with large M is growing, and it, this is embedded in a swarm of small planetesimals with mass small M. And this is the growth rate, right? And this is the cross section uh, for original cross section, taking into account the effect of gravitational focusing. So this part, pi r squared, one, is just a geometrical cross section, right? But now the planetesimal is, uh, the self gravity is affected, so then the planetesimal can gather the planetesimals, uh, which is you know outside this geometrical, geometrical cross section. So this is called Safronov number. So this is the effect of gravitational focusing, and this is actually larger than unity, and this is dominant. This term is dominant. And using these reasonable uh, relations, this can be reduced to this uh, form. So this relative growth rate is proportional to m to one third times uh, v a minus two, v to the minus two. So then from this form, we can understand this. it is this random velocity, right? the deviation velocity from the circular non-inclined orbit that controls the growth mode and also the time scale. So to understand this random velocity, is then it's very important. So and I have already uh, told you that the, it actually, initially, the growth mode of planetesimals is runaway growth. So, which is clearly shown by this experiment. And this is semi-major axis eccentricity. So, this is the result of end-body simulation. And initially, all planetesimals have equal mass. But this is 10 to uh, 100,000 100, uh, years and 200,000 years. So, you, you can see this uh, one body growing very fast. So what's happening here is this. So here, so the random velocity of these small planetesimals is independent of the mass of this growing body. So V random is now the function of the, the large M, mass of this one. So in this case, so V random is independent of M, so then we have this positive dependence of the relative growth rate on mass. So, which shows that growth mode is runaway. So we can also say in this way, at least on the linear stage, so where the back reaction of this growing body to the field planetesimal is negligible, we can have this runaway growth. And this uh, figure shows the mass distribution uh, or the same, for the same simulation like uh, this one. So this is mass, and this is the cumulative number uh, of planetesimals. So this is initially, all the planetesimals have this mass. And so after uh, we started simulations, it relaxes to some uh, power uh, distribution. So there's the power exponent is given by this. And at uh, two times 10 to five years, so which is this solid line, the mass distribution uh, consists of two parts, this uh, continuous uh, power law part and also one runaway body detached from this continuous distribution. So this is the runaway growth of planetesimals. So then the question here is, can we form the Earth just by runaway growth? But we can't. The runaway growth stalls uh, inevitably. So then what happens is this mode, so we call oligarchic growth. So this is semi-major axis and eccentricity. And initially, all planetesimals have equal mass. And this is time in year. So we have runaway growing body right here. But at some point, they stop growing, and then they try to keep some certain orbital separation. 
So orbital separation is different uh, in a semi-major axis. So if we, we have four planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, so then it's okay, we can reproduce the solar system. But instead of four planets, we have 15 uh, embryos here. So let me explain what's happening here. So first, so here we have the slowdown of runaway growth. So once this runaway growing body, these large bodies, mass exceeds critical mass, so which is about 100 times the mass of the field planetesimals, then this runaway growing body can very effectively scatter the surrounding planetesimals to increase the random velocity of planetesimals around it. In that case, we know the random velocity uh, of uh, surrounding planetesimals become dependent like, uh, on, well, uh, Hue radius, so linearly Hue radius, uh, proportional to Hue radius, and the Hue radius has this dependence. So plug in this relation to this random velocity, we have this negative dependence. So then the growth model shifts from runaway to orderly. So that's why among runaway growing bodies, embryos, we don't have, see runaway, but they are all have similar masses. So because of this slowdown of runaway growth. And during this uh, formation, so the growth, two adjacent protoplanets scatter. And by this scatter, gravitational scattering, they exchange angular momentum to expand their orbital separation. And so from this numerical uh, experiments, we now know this the typical orbital separation uh, on this stage is about 10 Hue radius. So that's why, so on this stage, so we cannot form four terrestrial planets, but maybe 15 uh, Mars-sized embryos. And they are stable. I mean, orbital is stable, orbital is stable. So we cannot have any more collisions on this stage. So we can analytically estimate the, the final mass of embryos, the protoplanets, by assuming uh, in situ formation uh, here, with no radial migration of planet building materials, and also the 100% accretion efficiency. So we can use all the materials here to form embryos. So then this isolation mass uh, is estimated by using the disk parameters. The sigma one is the surface density at one AU and alpha is the radial exponent of the planetesimal disk. We have uh, introduced in the planetesimal formation section, right? And B is the uh, orbital separation between two adjacent protoplanets. So you don't have to remember this uh, formula, but it's about the Mars mass, right, at one AU. So it's much smaller than the Earth. And the growth time also we can estimate uh, using this equation. But let me show you by this figure what about the mass of the embryos here. So together with the Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars masses, right? So for the standard protoplanetary disk for the solar system formation model, so where sigma one is 10 and alpha is three halves, and we have this isolation mass. So which is far smaller than the masses of Venus and Earth. But it's as high as those of Mercury and Mars, right? So from this figure, we infer. So to complete large planets, we need more collisions between embryos. But maybe Mercury and Mars are leftover embryos for the planet. So that's why there are two, two populations. 
but is it uh, really true? So let's try, uh, let's test it. So, so far, so from dust, planetesimal, and then we protoplanets or embryos we have, right? Then the last stage of tertiary plant formation is giant impact stage. And I, I said the protoplanets formed by oligarchic growth, it's stable. Yes, it's stable. If there's this gas, because this gas can dump the eccentricities and inclinations of embryos. But if gas disk disperses, then through gravitational scattering, the embryos build up the eccentricities and inclinations, and finally becomes orbitally unstable. So uh, from the observation, we know uh, that disk lifetime is maybe uh, less than 10 to 7 years, right? And after this time scale, so then the system becomes gas-free. And then from the numerical experiments, we know empirically that so the time scale given by this equation, so this semi-log dependence, the system becomes unstable. So let me show you this figure. So this is the that's orbital separation of embryos in the unit of Hue radius. And this is the time scale uh, for the system to be uh, orbitally unstable. And then, so just, just one you know, uh, increase in Hue radius leads to one order of magnitude uh, longer time scale for instability. So this semi-log uh, dependence, so many people have been working to, to understand physically why we have this dependence, but no one has succeeded. So maybe if you are good at some maybe chaos or something like that, so you can try it <laughs> to solve why we have this dependence for the instability time scale. But anyway, after this time scale, the system becomes uh, unstable and we can have giant impacts, so collisions between embryos. And this is an example of the N-body simulations of the giant impact stage. But let me first show you some examples. So this is a SPH simulation of impact. So this case, two embryos merge after a collision. So the energy dissipation by first contact is good, large enough for the two bodies to become one body, right? But sometimes, if the impact parameter is not small enough, it just hit and run. So in my n-body simulations, so we, we derive the condition for the margin of embryos as a function of impact parameters and the mass ratio of two bodies. And as a, so uh, from the numerical SPH collision simulations, we derive the conditions and we, we use it in n-body simulations. And let's see the orbital then evolution. So please remember, so Nadal's uh, talk, so he, he pointed out a very important th uh, thing. So because this, this, this system is chaotic in nature, so few body problem, right? So we cannot say if, for example, the evolution of this, this system uh, leads to a very similar system to the solar system. So, so we can learn what? <laughs> But we can, you know, we can do these kind of simulations many times, and we can we should analyze the system evolution so statistically, right? But I'm a bit hesitate to show you the very uh, successful case first. So this is semi-major axis eccentricity. So then, the, starting from the protoplanets uh, formed by oligarchic growth, then after gas disk dispersal, 
so the system becomes unstable on the time scale we've shown, uh, uh, we have seen. And in this case, I'm, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> this is like so assisted. But I learned hundreds of these runs, right? And what we found is that we, I derived some scaling laws, right? The mass distribution about, right? How the, the final mass or final orbital elements depends on the initial polar planet's properties. But let's see the, the same uh, run, but in a different way. So here we have uh, the sun here and embryos almost on circular orbits. And then we remove the gas component and then restart the simulation here. So you can see the or some or sometimes orbits cross, right? And they collide. And I like I, this animations because it's very easy to show you the the very important probability of this stage. So the giant impact continues until the system becomes stable. So what is this stable configuration? So which is like this, right? So in this configuration, two adjacent planets are well separated. Then gravitational interaction, interaction is, is weak then we, they, they cannot make more collisions. So, so what I, we can say here is, so by this process, so the uh, nearly circular orbit is inevitably formed. Otherwise, the system is unstable, right? So that's uh, partially a reason. Uh, of the, the coplanarity and also the near circular uh, orbits of the terrestrial planets in the solar system. So, and this, these are some basic, uh, uh, yeah, okay, so then this is the similar uh, uh, simulations, but different, uh, okay, different runs from the, the animations we have seen, just seen. But so, doing many. Uh, simulations of this kind, so we, we derived uh, some scaling laws about the, the terrestrial planets. For example, the mass of the largest and second largest planets have this relation to the total mass of the embryos. And mean orbital eccentricities and inclinations are 0.1, so which is higher than the solar system's uh, terrestrial planets. And the gross time scale is about 10 to 8 years. And Let's now uh, look at the spin parameters. So in my anabolic simulations, I follow the orbital, sorry, spin evolution uh, of uh, planets. So this figure shows the spin angular velocity against the mass of the planet. And here, this dotted line is this uh, critical uh, sorry, this one. This critical uh, angular spin angular velocity for rotational instability. So the planet cannot be uh, cannot spin faster than this. And if the spin velocity exceeds this one, then this this body fragment. So what uh, we found is then this the mean uh, spin angular velocity is about the seventy percent of this critical angular velocity, right, this one. And it's independent of the mass of the planet. Because this, the inertia moment and also the spin angular momentum uh, cancels out the dependence on the mass. And this effective spin angular velocity of the Earth-Moon system is 1.5 radian power hour, 1.5 radian power hour. And Earth's mass is one Earth's mass, right? Here like this. So maybe the, the present Earth's mass system is reasonably in this, the one sigma of this, of this, the result of these simulations. But very interesting result uh, found is this, this one. 
So this one, uh, this figure shows the obliquity distribution. So this is obliquity, and this is the normalized cumulative distribution of obliquity. So remember, the obliquity is the, the inclination of the spin axis from the orbit normal, right? So the Earth's uh, uh, obliquity is 23.4. So this uh, solid line is the, the result of the end-body simulations. But, and this uh, dotted line is the isotropic distribution. So isotropic. So here, isotropic means you know, that the direction of spin axis is equally possible for all the directions. So which is the natural uh, outcome of the giant impacts? Why? Because so during this giant impact stage, the scale height, so the vertical excursion of the protoplanets, is much higher, actually, than the physical size of embryos, protoplanets. So the collisions, giant impacts, are free, fully three-dimensional. It's almost random, right? And also random. So which leads to this isotropic distribution of obliquity? So that's the, the, the prediction. So here I summarize the probabilities of terrestrial planets formed by uh, giant impacts. So uh, about the mass, so the, we derived the mass distribution, sorry, the scaling law of the large planets like Venus and Earth. So they are proportional to the total mass of embryos. And the typical uh, outcome of the giant impact stage is two large planets and one or two leftover planetesimals, uh, sorry, polar planets and they may correspond to Mercury and Mars. So about the orbital elements, so eccentric inclination is 0.1, so typical value is higher so than the, the, those of Venus and Earth. So we need some, some dumping after the completion of uh, the Venus and Mars. Maybe that's uh, by the dynamical friction from the residual gas or uh, debris uh, formed by uh, impact and spin parameters. The angular velocity is about the breakup velocity, so maybe seventy percent of the breakup velocity. And the obliquity distribution is isotropic, which means uh, the typical spin axis is about ninety, right? So like like Uranus in the solar system. Just let me briefly comment the extension of the standard scenario. So far, so we talked about the standard scenario, and maybe already a bit modified or extended. But this extension of the standard scenario uh, is going on uh, in many ways now. So here I summarize the very important assumptions of the standard scenario. So here we assume the continuous power low disk, except the ice line or snow line. And we assume uh, in-situ formation of uh, planets. And we assume perfect accretion, so no disruption by collisions. And we assume building blocks, uh, sorry, uh, the typo here, uh, uh, kilometer size of planetesimals. But these are very, well, you know, highly idealized, right? But now, uh, for example, for this uh, continuous power law, this, this, this one. So we are working on the discrete, discontinuous uh, disk. So maybe formed by early disk evolution. And also many people are considering the radial migration of planets or planetary planets during the formation. And also we have already heard from Nadal's uh, talk so the not perfect accretion, but the original disruption and its effect on the composition is now taking into account. And also, some people uh, gave up uh, to form a planetesimals, but instead they use small pebbles uh, as a, a main planet building materials. So these, in these ways, the, 
uh, that standard scenario is, is modified and also extended uh, today. So maybe, uh, yeah, and this, the key uh, process is the formation with correct solid gas interaction in an evolving, not static disk, but in an evolving disk. Uh, it's, I think it's very important. So sorry, I'm now running out of the time. And so I, this grand talk model we have already seen uh, from the Nedal's talk, so I skipped this. And also, and I just I briefly comment this. So this grand talk model we've seen from the Nedal's talk is about the small mass and also the asteroid belt, the depletion of materials there, how to, re to realize that depletion of plant building material there. But the, here, so we also propose uh, this disk bump model. So due to the early uh, evolution of the gas disk, we now find we can have this, the, this is the gas surface density. The, this, we can have pressure bump around one AU. And as we have already learned, this high pressure area can correct, can gather uh, planetismas here. So which can uh, naturally lead to this formation of the localization of terrestrial planets. So here, this is radial distance and this is solid surface density. So initially, you can see this black uh, planetismal distribution. But along the, the, the gas disk evolution, so they just come to around this one, this area, this very limited area. And then they, they uh, accrete, they, they grow here to form terrestrial planets, like our own terrestrial planets. But this is also an example of the extension of the standard disk model. Okay, so let me summarize my talk. So we discussed the standard scenario for the terrestrial plant formation. So where the building blocks are kilometer-sized rocky planetesimals, and it consists of three stages. The first one is dust to planetesimals, the second one is planetesimals to protoplanets or embryos, and the final one is protoplanets to planets. And the time scale is 10 to the 8 years. And so these are what well, we already, uh, I already explained. So these are uh, Future, not future, but present prospects. So in these, these ways, this standard scenario is now being extended and also modified. And also, let me note that, so we already found more diverse terrestrial planets in exoplanetary systems. So what we need to do now is we need to construct a model or scenario which can explain both the terrestrial planets in the solar system, but also in exoplanetary systems, maybe depending on the, the properties of uh, protoplanetary disks. Okay, so this is the movie uh, rendered from uh, simulations we've already seen. So this is the sun and this is planetesimals. Right? So here the size of planetesimals are exaggerated 500 times, otherwise we can't see them. So first we look at the runaway growing growth stage. So you can see some runaway growing bodies. And after uh, about one uh, million years here. So this is the oligarchic growth stage. So you can see embryos. So we are now sitting on um, embryo. So here we have a gas component of the disk. So they are stable. I mean, orbitally stable. But on the time scale uh, of 10 to 7 years, so this gas disperses 
and now the final stage, giant inbox stage. So look at this red embryo. So on this stage, we have a collision per a few million years. So then we switch to SPH simulations. So in this case, they, they merge. So then we accelerate the evolution to see not individual uh, bodies, but their orbits. So this expression we've already seen also. You can see some secular interaction between orbits. So then system evolves until it reaches some stable configuration. And then after 10 to that 8 years, so terrestrial planets are formed. Okay, that's all. Thank you.